So we're in a series called One Whale of an Adventure. You can imagine the book we're studying. Jonah. Now, contrary to popular opinion, really Jonah has very little if nothing to do with a whale or a big fish at all. It looks cute and everything to play out with our children's story. But the truth of the matter is, the big fish is really nothing more than a vehicle of God's mercy. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit. But if you weren't here last week, we, um, we began the series with Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to move to Jonah chapter 2, but before we do, I want to give you a basic eight-word summary, so that if you forgot, if you weren't here, if you were trying to explain to someone what is Jonah chapter 1 about, here you go. It's eight words, and they all rhyme. You ready? God said go. Jonah said, no. God said, blow. Jonah said, so? Captain said, bro. Jonah says, bro. Sailor said, whoa. Jonah said, let's go. And that is the story of Jonah chapter 1. So, so really, in essence, what happens in Jonah chapter 1 is that God comes to this man who is a prophet, who is a man of God, and he has an assignment for him. The only problem is that Jonah doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. And you and I have all been in places where when God comes to us and leads us or is trying to prompt us in a given direction that we just didn't want to do it, right? We've all been in that place. And that's why it's important when we read the scriptures to find our place in the story. This isn't just an old story about somebody else. This is a story about you and I. Jonah chapter 1 opens to us a picture of rebellion. It's a picture of a person who thinks that the place they want to go to is better than the one that God wants them to go to. And so what happens, we discover, is that as we run from God... Our lives begin to unravel. It doesn't always immediately happen, but in essence, after a period of time, when you're on the run moving away from God's best for you, there's an impact, there's a toll that it takes on your life. But it's not only your life, it's the lives of those who love you, the people around you, that when you run from God and God's best, it not only touches your life, but it touches those around you. Because we don't live in a vacuum. So when we were getting to the end of Jonah chapter 1, what we found was that Jonah had instructed the sailors with him to take and toss him into the sea. They didn't want to do it. But eventually they relented and they threw him into the sea. And as he is going down to the depths, to the watery grave, his death, the very last verse in Jonah chapter 1 speaks to God's grace and His mercy. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story. And as we read through the story, I'm going to stop at certain places along the way and just make some comments so that as we're, as we're moving through the story, we're connecting with what's really going on and what's really going on inside of our own lives. Jonah's on the run from God, but God is running after him. You can run from God, but you can't outrun God. God's grace is far greater than our sin. And this is what we're going to find here in Jonah chapter 2. But I didn't read the last verse, which is verse 17. And I'll start with that in chapter 1. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now, I find it extremely funny and somewhat ironic that in chapter 1, everybody is obeying God but the man of God. The wind and the waves are responding to God's voice. The pagan sailors who previously knew God not at all are responding to God's voice. Even fish are obeying God's voice. The only one in the story who is not obeying God's voice is the one who should know better, is the man of God. I find it somewhat funny and a bit ironic, 
But if you would imagine his predicament, I want you to begin to think about what it would feel like as you descend to the bottom of the sea and then you are scooped up by a big fish. Now, whether you believe this story to be literal or metaphorical, it makes no difference in the context of what I'm about to tell you this morning. Because all of us, whether we've been in the belly of a big fish, literally or metaphorically, understand what it's like to be in a cold, dark, isolated place with no sense of hope. Can we not relate? Every single one of us, at some point in our lives, perhaps even right now, have found ourselves in the place we least wanted to be. And that's where Jonah is. It's dark. It's cold. There's no sign of hope. There's no sign of rescue. There's no sign of redemption. He has sunk to the lowest possible place any human being could possibly go. The story continues. <clears throat> then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish, and he said, I cried out to the Lord in my very trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Now this is significant. Like most of us, when things get their worst, we get religion. Right? When things couldn't possibly get any worse and we run out of all possible option, we get religion. We pray. That's what happens with the vast majority of us, isn't it? I mean, when we have exhausted every possible resource, the last one we go to is to cry out to God. And that's exactly what Jonah does here. Now, here's what's going to be important for you to understand, because this is going to drive chapter 2, and that is this. Jonah had forsaken God, but God had not forsaken Jonah. Sometimes we get to this place in our lives where we think, I've just done too much. I've just gone too far. There's no possible way that God would even want to hear from me, to hear my prayer. We base God's readiness to be attentive to us based on our lack or our inability to be right before God. And what you're going to need to understand is, is that that has nothing to do with God's desire to listen to you. Because God's love is not conditional. It is not conditioned on how well you are doing these things. God loves you more than you want to be loved most of the time. And why this is important is because until you get that, uh, fellow runner, you're going to run way longer and way farther than you need to. Because usually that's what happens, right? If we feel like, well, God, God is you know, not going to accept me. I've gone too far. I've done too much. Well, then what would be the point of turning back? If you think that he's uninterested, uncaring, unkind, unwilling to meet you in the place of your deepest needs, you just need to know before you run any further that he is. He's very interested. He's very concerned. And so you don't need to go another mile or two or three. You don't need to run any farther. Okay? Jonah says, I called out to him and he heard me. There was some recognition as he prayed that God was listening in the place of his greatest misery. Can you be more miserable than inside the belly of a big fish? I just have to ask you. This is an extreme picture of discomfort. And it's an extreme picture of misery and hopelessness. Could it be worse than that? I know some of you are thinking to yourself, yeah, I think it probably actually could be worse than that. You got a few hours for me to explain. This is a picture of misery and hopelessness and despair. But I want you to know, and I need you to know, that when we call out to God, He hears us. And He is responsive to our prayers. 
When Jonah needed God the most but deserved his presence the least, there he was. Okay? So let's continue. He said, You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me, and I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said to the Lord, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Well, let me just ask you, is this accurate? Right? He's praying to God in desperation. But is his prayer accurate in any way? Did God throw him into the sea? I don't think he did. Did God drive him from his presence? Jonah ran from God. God didn't run from Jonah. God actually wanted to partner with Jonah to do something great. He had greatness in mind when he called his friend. Jonah just didn't want any part of it. Why is it that when we get to this place, this is important, that our prayers sometimes can be a bit skewed? Do you find that he's lost a little perspective here? That's what happens when we hit places of misery, despair, and hopelessness. We can't see things rightly. We can't see things as they are. We can only see them as we are. And Jonah is in a miserable place. So he's saying that God is the author of actually driving him away. And it really isn't true. And you need to remember that right now. For those of you who are on the run or in places of desperation, sometimes the way you are remembering things might not be the most accurate way. It might not be most true that actually the thoughts you have about who God is is correct. Because that's what we do with God. We transpose onto God all of our ideas, be they right or wrong, good or bad, and we picture this God based on how we perceive ourselves. It isn't true. And you need to know that. Because when you're in a hard place, in a dark place, in an isolated place, your perspective is going to be a bit skewed. And I just want you to know, as one who has run with you, that sometimes when we're in this place, our thoughts don't accurately portray the nature and the character of who God is. And because of that, oftentimes when we see God in a wrong way, we'll keep running away from Him because we're afraid of that God. Any of you ever been afraid of the image or the character or the nature of the God that you had in your mind? And it caused you to run and run and run and run away? I want to re-image God for you. Because God is passionately concerned with pursuing his people. He wants Jonah to turn around and partner with him and do something great with his life. And that's where Jonah is now, though. He's at a place where he's going to need to turn around. He's going to need to have to repent. And so he's praying. But he remembers the story a little bit differently than it actually is. He continues, Yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, you snatched me away from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Now, just a question from curiosity from me. We know that Jonah was in the belly of the fish for how long? Three days and three nights. Okay? Out of curiosity, how long do you think it took for Jonah to begin praying? Do you think it took three days and three nights? Was it at the end or do you think it took three hours or three minutes or three seconds once the fish got in? I don't know about you, but if I were swallowed by a big fish and I'd start praying, <laughs> would, you not, would you wait a couple days? <laughs> I mean, would you just set up shop and wait a few days before you decide to start praying? 
I, I would probably pray as I was sinking before the fish got me, right? But here's the deal. So let's say he prayed sooner than later. Okay? Just because he turned to God and he began to pray and acknowledge God's presence in his life didn't mean that the effects of his rebellion were going to be immediately erased. He was going to have to live in the belly for a few days. And so, what I, what I gather from this is that sometimes when we're sincerely sorry for the things we've done, and we desire to turn from those things and turn to that which brings us life. There's some place in our head that thinks that all things should just get better immediately. Right? I mean, I said I was sorry. Right? I'm turning around going in the right way. Now fix all of this stuff that I've made. And I don't really think that's how it goes. You remember Moses? who had a problem, he was very impetuous, and he had an anger issue, uh, put it lightly, and one day his anger actually caused him to kill another man. You remember what he did as soon as he killed someone, there was a hit that was put out on his life, and so he ran basically to the backside of the desert and lived in obscurity for 40 years. 40 years. You think maybe some of those times on the backside of the desert when Moses was thinking about God's uh, promise and call on his life was thinking that he had basically ruined it, that he had lost it, that he couldn't be forgiven. Forty years is a long time, isn't it? Forty days is a long time. Sometimes forty minutes is a long time, right? But God would need over time to work things out in him so that he would be ready to do what God had initially called him to do. Did the children of Israel have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until the older generation died out? They didn't have to. It wasn't that long of a trip. If they would have moved in concert with God, it would have taken a whole lot shorter period of time, but they would not. They refused. And even when there was repentance, there was a long time before they made their way back to the place of promise. How about King David? King David, who was on the throne, there was no greater king than David in the Old Testament, right? And yet one day he, he, he can't deal with the urges of the lust that are within him. And so he takes another man's wife and he sleeps with her. He commits adultery. And then in order to clean that up, he has her husband killed. It's not a good plan. It just keeps spiraling. It gets worse and worse. His sin goes to a place where it begins to not only impact himself, but those around him. And finally, he gets to this place, Psalm 51, where he talks about the depths of his sorrow and the deep repentance in his life. But it's not going to keep from impacting his children, is it? It's not going to keep from impacting his family. It's not going to keep from impacting his life for some period of time. Here's the deal. Our sin has consequences. Our choices, our actions, they actually impact us on a very real level, even after we've said we're sorry and start to move in a new direction. We can't oftentimes stop that process, but if we could, I think it would actually hurt us more. Because I think there's a process by which we learn over time not to do the things that we do that cause so much misery and pain. I think if the consequences were just erased, I don't think we'd learn quite so easily. And listen, most of us don't learn quite so easily anyway. We have to bump our head into the same wall 18 times. Bruised and battered and beaten and fall down and mess up, don't we? But I think there's a place for consequences here. God is gracious to us, but He's not always gentle. God does not always intervene when we want Him to. I mean, we would be quick to do that, right? We would be quick to come and intervene to prevent people from experiencing pain. We just hate to see it. We hate to feel it, and we hate to see it with people we love. And this is just a side note, but I think it's important to say 
There are people in our lives that we know who are on the run from God. And their lives are starting to unravel. And it's not only impacting them, it's impacting you. It's impacting your family, it's impacting your set of friends, it's impacting anybody who has any relation to this person. And you have probably tried, if you love them enough, to intervene over and over and over and over again. And to what end? Still, they're on the run. And I just want to say to you, sometimes the most gracious thing you can do for that person is to throw them in the water. Sometimes the most gracious thing you can do is to give them to God. And stop trying to fix and intervene and prevent from pain. Sometimes pain can be the most redemptive tool in God's hand to bring about change. Now there is no unique recipe for me to say, when you hit this point, then release them to God. Probably on the front end it would just be easier for you to do that from the start. It is very difficult for me to tell you how to best to love someone. It's hard. Because loving people is super messy. I mean, anybody who wants to come and tell you exactly how to do it, you know, because of their own life experiences, are often well-intentioned, but, but more often than not misguided. There's no real recipe for how you love rebels. There's no real recipe for how you love people, people who you deeply are are in relationship with and who you desperately love and you want there to be a better life for them. There's no recipe for how you how you navigate the path that you may be on with them. All I'm saying to you is this. In our great attempts to spare people from pain and the consequences of their actions, we oftentimes prolong the process. We do. We wouldn't want to but it's just part of what happens when we don't let God have his way in their life. The soldiers, the, the sailors, they didn't want to throw <coughs> Jonah overboard. They begged him, actually, to come up with a different plan. Jonah just said, might as well get it over with. Go ahead and toss me. And that's what they did. Last thing I'll say before we move on is, do you know it's in God's heart to deliver us from our problems, from our issues, from our sin, from our addictions? It's in God's heart to deliver us. But sometimes, looking at Jonah's story and looking at my own, it just might have to get dark and scary and messy before it goes. Every single one of us in this place would avoid it. If given the option, we would avoid dark, scary, and messy. But what Jonah teaches us is that sometimes in order for deliverance to take place, dark, scary, and messy has to happen in the And that bothers us. If we knew the end result was that everything would be better, we could more easily release people into God's care. But the fact that we can't control on the end what's ultimately going to happen keeps our hands in the mix, trying to intervene and prevent. At the end of the day, whether it works out the way you want it to or don't want it to, you can trust God or not. Because that's really ultimately the issue. Am I going to take this biggest problem confronting me, this biggest issue in my life, am I going to trust God with it? Or am I going to try to keep micromanaging it until something changes? I'll just ask you, how's the micromanaging going? If it's working for you, keep at it. If it's not, you might consider a different tack. Sometimes, Jonah has to be thrown into the water. It's the only way deliverance is going to happen. The very thing that Joan believes to be the worst possible place on planet Earth to be is actually the vehicle of God's mercy and grace. 
Can you fathom that? The very worst possible place on planet Earth. That's what this story is telling us. The very worst possible place on planet Earth is actually the vehicle for God's <coughs> mercy and grace to deliver him. And that just might be true for you and me too. Perhaps instead of resisting, perhaps instead of trying to prevent all of the things that are coming as a consequence of our actions, perhaps if we just relent and open ourselves, perhaps there might be deliverance sooner than later. And I know that some of you know what I'm talking about. Just know it. Let's continue. So he gets to this place towards the end of his prayer and he says this. He says, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Who had turned his back on God's mercies any more than Jonah? At this point in the story, I'm not sure whether he's talking about the people to which he's getting ready to go to, the Assyrians or himself. I've heard people quit pig and talk about and debate who he's talking about here. I have a sense he's talking about himself. But as he's talking about himself to God, he then begins to make a vow. And I don't know how he's offering sacrifices with songs and praise, but he's moved from a place where he's desperately in the most physically difficult place of his life. It's the place of greatest misery, and now he's singing songs inside the fish. It's his sacrificial praise. He's come to his senses. Did you know that he's still in the dark? Did you know that you can sing songs of praise even while you're still in the dark? Even while things are not going the way you want them to, did you know that you can actually still, as an expression of your faith, sing songs of praise. That's a possibility. I mean, you can write a complaint. That's another one, too. But you can actually praise God in the midst of the place you least want to be. And that's what he's doing here. It's, an, it's a miraculous turnaround. And so he begins to make vows. And the vows he makes, I think, probably have something to do with his obedience to what God called him to do in the first place. I bet he said, if you let me out of here, you remember these kind of prayers. If you'll only get me out of here, I will. Right? Do you pray this prayer before? If you only get me out of here, I will actually go to these dreadful, despicable, violent Assyrians, and I will tell them what you told me to tell them. He's making vows now. He's singing songs of praise, and he's making vows. He knows that if he doesn't fulfill his vows, that God, that he can't outrun God. Because then he says, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. That's why we couldn't do enough to earn favor with God. Salvation comes from God alone. Did you know that you can't possibly earn God's favor? It's impossible. No matter how good you are, for how long you live, it is simply impossible to earn your way with God. You can't save yourself by being good enough. You just can't. Your salvation is from the Lord alone. And that's why also you cannot sin your way out of His favor. Do you understand a God whose love knows no condition? I think truthfully we don't. Because a God whose love knows no condition and who will pursue us and actively desire to partner with us is one worth getting to know. And yet so often we run from Him because we've envisioned this God to be something that has caused us to believe that His plans for us are less good than the ones we have for ourselves. He has this epiphany. My salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. Period. 
exclamation point. Did you know that? Your salvation comes from God. It's His gift to you. Your part is to determine whether or not I'll actually receive it and live from it. Because when you have been saved, the grace that saves you also liberates you to be graceful to others. Do you know that grace is not just meant to be hoarded? We're not on this kingdom train content that we're going to be with God in heaven forever. We actually are people who are liberated to be kind and generous and graceful and good. Our salvation comes from the Lord alone. And as he gets to the end part of his prayer, listen to what happens in the last verse. It says, Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. That had to be ugly, right? <laughs> it is ugly, isn't it? It's ugly. The whole story is just ugly and beautiful all at the same time. It's quite a story. But God wants deliverance. He doesn't want Jonah inside the belly of the fish. And he doesn't want you to be in the place of your deepest misery for the rest of your life either. He doesn't like it when you're in a cold, dark, isolated place. He doesn't. There's nothing good that comes from that for him. Why? Because he, he made you for purpose. He made you for greatness. He has wonderful plans for your life. But when you're moving away from that, out of concert with what his desire is, it inevitably is going to impact you. When you turn your back on the source of all wisdom and all knowledge and all love, it can't help but impact who you are and how you live. And so sometimes it has to get dark and scary and messy before you come to your senses and say, you know what, I, I just, I don't even know. I was actually afraid of you because I thought I'd blown it for the last possible time. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even know where we go from here. But I know I want to go someplace different than where I've been going. And so as he starts to remember and reflect and meditate on history with God, he looks one more time in his darkness towards God. And he opens his mouth and he speaks to God in a way that enables God to believe that he wants to partner again in union with him. And when he's ready, when Jonah's ready, God, God orders the fish. He appoints the fish to spit him out. Now can you imagine when Jonah, and we'll look at this next week, can you imagine what would have been on Jonah as he's wandering through Nineveh. That would have been a scary sight, right? I mean, our zombie movies have nothing on this, right? So he's wandering through. This is a first-hand example of what will happen to one if when they hear the good news, they don't turn. So he is living proof in their midst. And there he is. And there we are. And so where we end chapter 2 is this. So you've been running from God. Maybe you didn't even really see it as running. But you know when you hear this story that there's some place in you that's resistant from what God wants for you. And perhaps it's been resistant for longer than you care to say But there's some place in this dark, cold, isolated place that you find yourself. There's some place where God is calling to you to do different. And he's giving you the space to make that choice yourself. I mean, your mother and your father and your brother and your sister, your friend, your husband, your wife... They've all been trying to make this decision for you, but they can't do it for you. And they've prolonged the process because they didn't want you to feel the pain. But now you're in the place of deep pain, and what's left for you to do is get religion. Turn to God. And say to God all that you need to say to God. 
whether it sounds good or it doesn't sound good, whether it feels theologically right or theologically incorrect, makes no difference. God's not a Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. I know it might surprise some of you to know that. God doesn't care how it comes out, what form and what creed and what shape. He only wants you to come to your senses and understand that He has great plans for your life. And if you'll run with Him rather than away from Him, life will only get better. You might not think so, but you can trust Him. And if you don't, well then you can keep running. It's an option God gives us. But understand, when you run away from all wisdom and all knowledge and all love, there are consequences on you and on the people you most dearly love. And at some point, in that dark, scary, cold, isolated place, some point, it's important for us to take a page out of Jonah's book and just turn around and open up. So, Lord, Jonah chapter 2 teaches me that even in the place we least want to be, that when we call out to you, you hear us. And that, Lord, you desire to deliver us. And so I pray right now that those who are here, who are in a place that they desperately don't want to be in, that you would grace them with the courage and the strength cry out to you. And I pray that those who are enabling bad behaviors, that you would grace them with the strength to throw their loved ones in the water. Because at some point along the way, pain is inevitable. But Lord, misery is optional. Speak to us where we are. Give us exactly what we need. And lead us to life. In Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, if you look at Matthew chapter 12, there's this place where Jesus is talking about their people around him are wanting signs. They're wanting all kinds of signs and wonders. And he points them to the fact that he's already given them a sign. He said the sign was the sign of Jonah. And Jonah is a foretaste, three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, as to the three days and three nights that Jesus spent in the belly of the earth, in the belly of hell. And he said the sign of Jonah is to point you to Jesus, to me, who teaches you that from the place of death can come life. From the place of darkest death can come life. And that's a hopeful sign for you and me. You should read it in Matthew chapter 12 and the other things later today. Alright, so how we want to finish our service today is um, how we finish it normally on the second Sunday of each month. And that is um, with this thing that we call all prayers. Now, when you came in, there was a slip of paper on your chair. And if you have that, um, what I want to do is I want to give you a few moments to consider what it is that...